Many, if not all, family historians and genealogists have photographs of their family members uh, going back some years. And it's important to be able to put some context to the photographs, to date them, to actually know who's in the photographs. So this set of videos, uh, this is part one, which will discuss the types of photographs. Part two will discuss what you can look for in the photograph. And part three will be a small uh, case study. These videos are not intended to replace the more intensive and expert videos that are available on the internet or books. It's really a primer. It's part of my genealogy basics series. So let's go ahead and talk about the types of photographs that are available or maybe in a genealogist collection. Daguerreotype is an early photographic process that was invented by a French artist and inventor Louis Daguerre in the 1830s. The process was the first practical method for creating permanent images with a camera and was widely used in the 19th century. A daguerreotype photograph is highly detailed and finely crafted on a polished silver coated copper plate. Daguerreotype images are known for their exceptional detail and clarity and for the unique way to capture the texture of the subject as we can see in some of the later pictures. However, the process was quite labor intensive and required specialized equipment which made it expensive and time consuming to produce. Despite this, daguerreotypes became popular and fashionable for portrait photography in the mid 19th century and for those who could afford it. Many notable figures at the time we'll see on daguerreotypes. If you're lucky enough to have a daguerreotype, it will need special storage. Here are two classic examples of daguerreotypes. Um, the one on the left has been hand colored in a looks like a, a copper frame with a velvet box top um, these types of frames can be dated there are sites on the internet that will allow you to date the frame so if you if you can't date the photograph the actual frames um, when the silk was available or the types of color will help you date it this on the left is actually dated 1849 the one on the right is actually a daguerreotype of a woman holding a daguerreotype so again um, that could be dated further and uh, this is black and white not being hand colored so if you're lucky enough to have these uh, you can date these 1840 to 1860 more or less anyway uh, mm -hmm. and you don't probably need to do extensive dating of the subject if you know who it is an amber type is a type of photographic image that became popular after the daguerreotype although at first glance it has a similar look. It is a positive image made on a piece of glass rather than metal. And it is a distinctive appearance that sets it apart from both daguerreotypes and tintypes. The exposure time for this type of photograph was really long, typical several seconds. So the sitter had to remain very still during the process. And this is why you see many people on uh, amber types and daguerreotypes looking very, very serious. There's not many smiling faces on these types of photographs. Uh, in fact, you often see a blared person in a, in a group shot. After the photograph was developed, the final step was to back the glass plate with a dark material, such as black paint or velvet, which gave the image a black or dark brown background. The amber type could then be placed in a frame or presented in a protective case. Typically, amber types were popular from the 1850s, mid 1850s to the 1870s but were eventually replaced by newer, easier photographic processes such as the tin type that we'll discuss next. Actually, today they're very highly sought after by historians and genealogists because of their unique and beautiful appearance. Here are some examples of amber types. As you can see, at first glance, they look very similar to daguerreotypes, similar types of subjects, similar types of frames, but obviously the medium being glass is very different. A historian looking at the frames in the studio may be actually able to date both these types of photographs by the type of frame as you can see there's three different examples here uh, different studios will have used different types of frames at different types um, in the right side you can see that the lady in the picture has a brooch of a man around her neck and again this indicates as we'll discuss later that you need to really look at the detail but nobody here is smiling and nobody in daguerreotypes typically smiles and the main reason for this is 
the subjects are told to sit very still for a long time and not to move so they look very sullen especially the chap in the middle the photograph we have here is a tintype also known as a ferrotype which is a photographic process that was widely used in the mid 19th to early 20th centuries it involved creating a direct positive image on a thin sheet of metal typically iron or tin hence the name tintype they were popular because they were relatively expensive to produce and provided a fast turnaround time for portraits the resulting image was often small durable could easily be framed carried or even mailed to friends and family however the process was also challenging as the metal plates had to be prepared and developed very quickly and in complete darkness to avoid overexposure and underdevelopment many genealogists have a tintype in their collection or a copy of a tintype and they were most popular between 1860 and 1880 but they actually stayed in use long after that even up to the second world war and even today some photographers that like the type of photograph that a tintype produces are actually producing tintypes tintypes were actually taken in studios they were taken outside and even at carnivals or fairs where you could pay a relatively small sum to have a tintype taken there and then now because of the durability and accessibility and the time span of tintypes a tintype photograph will not date itself other techniques will have to be used here are some examples of tintype photographs that i've just pulled off Flickr, and there are literally thousands of examples of tintype if you google uh, tintype photographs on the internet what I wanted to point out here is that the shots are now becoming more varied than the typical portrait shots of daguerreotypes and ambrotypes. The backgrounds are becoming more complex. And in the three examples here, there's no frames or the frames become simpler. Uh, there's a lot of examples of hand colored uh, tintypes as well, uh, or where they've used one or two colors. So these you will see very often and lots and lots of examples. If you ever watch the Victorian drama on TV or on uh, streaming services, you may have seen somebody leave a visiting card when they was at somebody's house or somebody asked for a card. This was typically a carte de visite, which was a French term, um, which translates literally to visiting card in English. In the 19th century, these are small rectangular photographs were mounted on a thin piece of card and were a popular way for people to introduce themselves and exchange contact information. There was a little larger than a business card, as we can see here. They were often used by people in the, typically used by people in the upper and middle classes and were especially popular amongst women. And they played an important role in social networking at this time and helped establish personal and professional connections. Next, we have cabinet cards and cabinet card photographs were a style of photography portrait that was popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and they were named after the card stock on which they were printed which was typically four and a quarter by six and a half inches or approximately 11 by 16 and a half centimeters in size and they were thick enough to stand up on their own in a cabinet hence the name cabinet cards and they were a very popular means of creating and distributing photographs and were widely used for family portraits or commemorative portraits advertising they were also used to showcase celebrities, public figures, presidents, all that kind of stuff. The name of the studio was normally prominently featured on both the front and back of the photograph. The popularity of cabinet cards began to decline with the advent of smaller, more portable photographic formats, such as the snapshot and the postcard in the early 20th century. And here are some examples of carte de visites and cabinet cards. On the left is a carte de visite. And this would, as, as we said, be pretty small um, and just have a portrait or full length portrait. In terms of the cabinet cards, we can see now the photographic studio is very, very heavily embossed on the back on these two examples and on the front as well. And it will both around 1890s time, you can see from the dress. Many people, many genealogists will have uh, cabinet cards probably in their collection of family photographs. Even if it's a copy of a cabinet card, the giveaway will be the actual name of the studio on the bottom of the card, in it, as the examples show here. Postcards, as the name suggests, is a technique of 
producing a photograph on basically a postcard as we see today and it was split down the back with an address for one side and correspondence on the other and a place for a stamp to be placed studios could use their own photographs you could actually have a photograph taken in the studio or customers could bring their own photograph for it to be put on a postcard format as the example would here show um, they were around for about 40 years from the early 1900s to the mid to late 1940s depending on the countries that we were in here is an example of a postcard and it's a studio shop postcard and looking at the back of the postcard itself we can get some information on the example on the left is the name and the address of the studio that embossed the photograph to the postcard and the actual studio may have taken the photograph as well it's not implicit from the photograph where it was taken you may well be lucky enough as well to have a postcard that was mailed and in this case we'll have an address like the address here in Dover and perhaps the stamp has been franked in a way you can read the stamp and this stamp this actual postcard was mailed on October the 26th 1906 so now we're moving more and more to what looks like modern day photography when the box brownie was introduced for a dollar in 1900 in the US it began the modern photographic era from that day onwards most people could take their own photographs without relying on an expert studio this is the, probably the period where the bulk of your or anybody's family photographs will come from. But in the last 120 years, photography has transitioned from black and white to color, from film to digital. Each advance in photography will enable different dating techniques on the type of photograph, the paper and the medium used. Many photographs will have a developer's date code on the back or a studio copyright on the reverse to help you date them. In the last few years, especially recently, in 2022-2023, uh, the ability to repair and colorize your photographs have become very easy, and many genealogical sites will allow them to be done free for members. Colorizing photographs actually creates a lot of debate on sites on the internet about whether it should be or shouldn't be done, but my opinion is that you should always colorize a photograph if you can do it. Obviously, keep the original but colorization is a wonderful way of getting more perspective on a photograph, maybe looking at details you couldn't see before. Here are some older photographs that have been colorized. As you can see, the colorization is fairly drab, giving a more of a sepia appearance to these old photographs, both are about 100 years old, and it tends to blare out some details. But it will allow you maybe to take a perspective on that you have not seen before, maybe pick out some details. Be skeptical of the colours. Uh, maybe John Longman on the right had a brown beard or maybe it had been grey. The artificial intelligence that colours photographs at the moment is not foolproof. So use this as a guide to dating, a guide for a different perspective, but not something that's going to be 100% accurate. Here is an example of a photographic repair and colorization that's more successful than some of the older photographs. This photograph is from the early 50s, uh, probably around 1952. As you can see, it's pretty badly damaged, cracked, and uh, been folded. So using an online tool, I was able to repair the photograph in step one. And you see that repairs it and makes it a lot clearer. And then I was able to add colorization to the photograph. These colors from, from chaps in the Royal Air Force, we know the uniform is almost exactly the right color. So this colorization repair has been very successful and will allow me to actually pick up more detail. Again, the colors are probably not 100% accurate, but a very pleasing result. And why should people should use these online tools whenever they can. Thank you for watching part one of this video series on photographs. The links to part two and part three are in the comments below. And please leave comments or any thoughts. I'd love to hear them. Thank you.